Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're going to recap the Fed statement, market reactions on the back end of that, including currency reactions as we are chatting with Mark Chandler, managing partner at Bannockburn Global Forex. Mark, please make sense of this environment where we heard from the Fed and a number of other central banks this week broadly saying that they will be cutting rates this year outside of the Bank of Japan that actually raised rates and got out of their negative interest rate policy. But when we look at the market reaction here from the Fed and Jerome Powell's press conference, markets broadly higher and the dollar also higher. The U.S. dollar over 104 right now. Make sense of this environment, Mark, here, where it seems like a lot of different sectors are doing well. Yeah, I wish I could make sense of it. I sort of see uh, five big developments that are sort of shaping things. Uh, the first, I think, is you're right about the Bank of Japan. First time they've hiked rates in 17 years. Dollar gets up to almost 152 that capped us in both in 2022 and 2023. Japanese are threatening intervention using the word cues that in the past have signaled intervention. So uh, this put the yen into play. Like I say, this is the, the, the last of the central banks to have negative interest rates. Second thing that happened that the, will be remembered for this past week was the Swiss National Bank. They became the first of the G10 central banks to hike interest rates. And partly, I suspect that what's going on there is not only a favorable domestic situation of falling inflation and slower growth, but also the Swiss wanted to cut rates before the ECB to make sure that some of this currency weakness the Swiss franc has experienced isn't reversed. Third important thing that happened this week, and this just happened uh, today, the PBOC, that's the People's Bank of China, allowed the dollar to go above 7.2 against the RMB. This has been capping the dollar all year. The dollar rose to its best level since last November. And I think that what the PBOC is saying is that they just aren't playing for an inch or a small move. I think that the risk is now that we're above 720, we go back into that range that we were in in the second half of last year, roughly 725, 730. The fourth big thing then that happened this past week is Mexico. Mexico cut interest rates. What makes it uh, memorable, I'd say, is that it's the first time Mexico's cut interest rates in this cycle. Other countries like Colombia and Brazil cut rates 50 basis points this past week. Mexico delivered a 25 basis point cut. And if anything, it was seen as a hawkish cut, meaning that when they cut interest rates, they also raised their inflation forecast for this year. And so we even have, even today, even though the dollar is broadly stronger, it's, the peso is really more or less holding its own. And that brings us to the fifth thing and most important, perhaps, for many of us, and that is the Federal Reserve. So the, as you pointed out, the Federal Reserve did keep policy steady, like everybody expected. Uh, they, to, to the extent that there was a surprise, it was that the Federal Reserve kept the median dot looking at three rate cuts this year. Initially, the market sold off on that. That is, a dollar sold off on that because there were many people who expected the Federal Reserve, in light of what the media called hot inflation, which was only like, say, one-tenth of a percent above a survey, that the many people thought the Fed would scale back from three to two. And so initially, the dollar sold off. But then as people thought about it, and here's what it looks like, the Federal Reserve the median dot went up for growth by a lot, from 1.4% to 2.1%. The Fed says there's going to be more growth this year, and it lowered the unemployment median dot from 4.1% to 4%. We were at 3.9% in February, so that means very little deterioration of the labor market this year. And they kept the PCE deflator unchanged, their forecast for it, even though they hiked by two-tenths of a percent the core rate. And so... The market looks at this and sees a more optimistic economic outlook. And out of the 19 Fed officials that cast their votes, 10 of them were thinking three or more cuts. Nine of them were two or fewer cuts. And so this shows the Federal Reserve much more evenly divided between the two and three cuts. And so we did see uh, the dollar bounce back Within about 12 hours or so of the FOMC meeting, initially it sold off, it came roaring back, and it's finishing the week on a very strong note. Well, Mark, just to that point, 
as far as the Powell presser afterwards, he reiterated the point as far as the labor markets that this, regardless of what happens, unless something dramatic changes, it's not going to have an impact on their desire to stick with the three cuts. And I think some of the market moves from what other articles and other pundits were saying is that there was just more certainty now. Like uh, there was a lot of uncertainty going into this meeting, and at least Powell provided some certainty as far as, hey, there's going to be three more cuts. Even if they're divided on it, there's still a majority vote for that. I think that gave the market some comfort. But you had made the point to us off mic that part of the reason they want to do three cuts is just to normalize real rates. Because as real rates have gone higher, when inflation has come down and the rates are still high, they want to bring the real rates down. Maybe talk about that part of the equation with the Fed. I think that, that's, that's right. I think that how the Federal Reserve is, say, spinning is trying to explain their rate cuts. Because remember, uh, they've been looking at for rate cuts this year since around the middle of last year. They had three cuts at the median dot in December, and the three dots, uh, the three cuts remained here in the March iteration of the summary of economic projections, which I encourage you and your listeners to take a look at. You can you can find it on the internet. It's a free summary of economic projections, March 2024. This document is is available, publicly available. And so and it's got it's got the dispersion of the Fed's views. And so here's what I think happens is the Federal Reserve says we want to engineer a soft landing. And they are very vocal about soft landing and their forecasts illustrate what they mean by the soft landing. And so as inflation declined, and, and Powell kept on talking about this bumpy path, meaning that they recognized that every month is not going to be improvement, but the longer term trend will be towards lower inflation back to target, which is not completely independent, of course, of what the Federal Reserve does. And among the things that it said it will continue to do is unwind its balance sheet ninety-five uh, with a cap uh, at $95 billion a month. That looks like it's going to be tapered, maybe starting next month, maybe starting in June, but the tapering seems to be coming. So as the Federal Reserve wants to uh, wants to ensure, increase the odds of a soft landing, what this requires is to maintain the same level of restriction. But as to, and to your point, as inflation falls, the real interest rate tends to rise. And so to preserve the same level of of restraint on the economy requires to lower the nominal rate, to push down the real rate, and so to keep the real rate the, the sort of the same level, so to unwind some of the gains that might be taking place that could force the economy into recession. So I think that what this means is that the first cut or two cuts from the Federal Reserve will not be explained as easing of monetary policy, though to, to those of us in the market will recognize lower interest rates are lower interest rates. But the Federal Reserve will try to explain them not so much as easing policy as maintaining the same level of restriction, which takes a little bit of the sting away. Look, that's great that the Fed can justify these rate cuts however they want. But as you said, fact of the matter is a rate cut is a rate cut. And that is a very different trend than the Fed has been on through that aggressive rate hiking policy. Mark, when we tie this into inflation, and as you said, look, the Fed even knows it will be a bumpy road getting down to their target level. Do you think, are you on the side that says, the Fed might move too early here before inflation is at their target level, and that could end up costing them on the backside. Yeah, no, I, I tend to, I think that the key to remember in this in this context is that monetary policy takes place with a lag. And so if you wait for inflation to reach its target, it might be too late to avoid a harder landing. In the same way, that you don't wait for it. the Federal Reserve doesn't typically. I mean, this cycle is unique uh, because of COVID. But the Fed, you wouldn't want a central bank to wait till inflation is above the target to begin raising interest rates. I sort of think of it as like toothpaste. Once it's out of the tube, it's hard to put it back in. Well, that's the truth. And they got a little behind the curve there to start working on inflation. But now they don't want to go too far in the restrictive camp, and they want to bring things back down to to keep things at the same level of restriction, as you say. How does this relate to the currency markets? We have seen, as you noted, a big move in the dollar. I know you look at a lot of other dollar pairs versus other currencies. What do you think is driving the dollar here? Is it the U.S. policy or is it the moves overseas and so many other central banks? Can I say yes to both in the sense that it's not, it, it is the Fed, but it's also relative sense. And that's what I really like about the currency markets. When you, when you have a bond or a stock, you can sell that. 
and you can buy another asset. But when you're in the currencies, you can only sell the currencies and get another currency. So you're sort of stuck in this fiat currency space, if you will. And so partly it's relative. But I think that uh, what's driving this, and I think that, say, if we take a look at the dollar index, I think that the dollar index is a beginning or is into its third move of the year. Remember, the first move took place after the dollar index fell sharply in Q4. And we corrected, that is, we rallied from the beginning of this year through Valentine's Day, call it the middle of February. Then the dollar index backed down, corrected, and actually fell down back to below uh, 102.5. And from there, earlier this month, that's the low from sort of middle, uh, earlier this month, rather. And now we're moving back higher. And I suspect we're going to take out that mid-February high, which is around 105. And my next target is 106. And this is to say that the dollar is moving higher, partly because I think that the, uh, the sense is, one, is that you're still paid to be long the dollar against almost all the other G10 currencies. So that's because the interest rate differential is high and it's going to remain high. Secondly, the market might be a bit more confident. It is also even more confident that the ECB, for example, possibly the Bank of England, possibly the Bank of Canada, will cut rates before the Federal Reserve. And the other factor I just want to say is in the short run, what, re what really matters, I think, is uh, momentum and psychology. And, and I think the psychology is such that we saw Almost every data point that came out since the Federal Reserve met has been stronger than expected. And looking ahead, I know it's a bit far for some of us who are like day-to-day -day trading, but you look at the next bat, this month's jobs report coming out that first week in April, and the early call is for 200,000 jobs. And even though it's a little bit lower than we've been running, it'll be the fourth, if it's true, if it's accurate, it'll be the fourth consecutive month above 200,000. So I would say that the U.S. economy still looks like it's growing, and the Fed's upward revision to its own growth forecast recognize that, while our friends, our allies, our competitors are all having problems. Europe still looks stagnant. Their flash PMI for March was very weak. Now, the same is really true, I think, uh, to a lesser extent for the U.K. Uh, Japan uh, didn't contract in Q4, but it's off to a very weak start here in Q1 uh, due to partly an earthquake that took place on January 1st. And of course, China is still having its own economic challenges. So I think in a, in a relative sense, the U.S. still looks like it's, it's like the shining light. So on top of that, even with rate cuts coming, not just from the U.S., but around the world, from an investment standpoint, are you focused more on those interest rate sensitive sectors that broadly did lag the strong moves in the markets, but are now playing catch up? Well, I don't know. I think that uh, just from where I sit, I, I tend to look more like global markets. And I still like the idea. And so my, my assumptions are twofold. One is that most of us uh, in the U.S., Canada, are really biased. We are overweight our own markets. And secondly, that given the, the, given the U.S. dollar's strength, for U.S. dollar-based investors, uh, this might be a good time to just diversify portfolios looking at European and Japanese stocks to take advantage of the strong dollar, like Warren Buffett is, has been doing for about a year now. And I think that countries, uh, other countries' valuations uh, don't seem as extreme as they are in the U.S., even though uh, U.S. companies, I want to say, uh, I was just doing this uh, report, and, you know, back in the... Uh, Last time we thought an Asian power was eating our lunch, we thought it was Japan in the late 80s. And at that time, I want to say that there was about uh, the top 10 companies in the world. Six of them were uh, U.S. and four of them were Japanese. And now I think nine out of the top 10 are American. And so I think that you give up, you give up those, uh, some of the commanding heights, but there's good valuation and taking advantage of a strong dollar. Because I still think that even though it's hard for us to get this timing right, uh, when does the cycle turn? When does the dollar, which has been in a bull market for the better part of a decade, when does that really end? And it's not clear when it ends. The only thing I feel very confident of is it's not going to last forever. And so that means that we ought to be diversifying and preparing for the time when the dollar, the dollar's decade-long rally ends.
Well, Mark, another way investors are diversifying outside of just U.S. equities is into the precious metals. You said there was five important things that happened this week, but I want to throw in a six, Mark. Gold hit a new all-time high again midweek. It was really after Wednesday's Fed meeting that overseas trading, it, it blasted up to $2,224 at one point, pulled back, silver ratcheted up, and then they swiftly reversed on Thursday. And I'd like to get your thoughts on it because we keep hearing from the marketplace and even from the gold community that all of this buying is central bank buying. And you had a different take on it. We've talked to a couple other guests about this, but there seems to be a big shift to more Asian interest in the East, not just from China, but also from India, also from South Korea, also from Vietnam and Cambodia. There's a lot of Asian buying. There's also Indian wedding season buying. Do you think that's playing a factor here or is everything just about the Fed? Yeah, I agree. I think that a couple of things. One is I'd say that it does seem to me that the central bank buying gold, when I think about that, I kind of think that central banks are not very price sensitive. Right? They don't really market to market. They don't have to do deal with any of the things that as private sector uh, participants we have to. So first, I'd say that, that that's why it seems to me that central bank buying is interesting. But when I look at it, even like a lot of people get caught up in Chinese buying a gold because they've been buying it for months on end now. But when I look at what percentage of their treasury bonds have they really diversified, it's a very small amount. That I, it's hard to call it a little diversification when you're talking about one or two percentage points over years, of time, you know. But I do think that the private sector much more interesting, uh, much more price sensitive. And there, I think you're right. I mean, if I had to make a like a poster uh, recipe of what's the ideal buyers of gold, leaving aside the central banks and officials, I'd say people who live in countries that have weak banking systems or questionable banking systems, lack of transparency capital controls, and uh, say, uh, limited other investment opportunities. So I think that applies to China. I, I mean, you can see this with com countries that have capital controls. Uh, like you can look at the Shanghai price of gold, and you'll see it's trading higher than it is in London or New York. Same thing in Turkey. The same thing in, in countries that have capital controls, uh, limited, limited what people can do, take their money out of that system, and gold becomes a sort of a back door into diversification. So I think that's a real issue. I think that's, to me, that's probably that and, of course, just speculation in general, uh, I think is really behind the gold rally. On a day-to-day -day basis, I tend to look at the direction of the U.S. dollar and interest rates. And on most days that the dollar is stronger, gold tends to be weaker. But as you know, gold has been, gold has shot up this year, but I'm really talking about on a day-to-day -day basis. And so because I have this more optimistic outlook for the dollar in the near term, I think we can go back down and test that, test this breakout area, call it 2150, maybe even if that last, November, uh, last December is high, closer to 2135. So somewhere 2135, 2150, I think would be a nice pullback for gold, given, the, given what I expect to be dollar strength through the jobs report in two weeks. So gold continuing to at least stay strong, even if it pulls back to those low 2100, still historically a great price for gold. Why then, Mark, are the stocks not responding to it? Is it simply just that lack of Western demand? Yeah, I don't know. I think it is. What is the play? So imagine I'm in a China. The uh, property market is horrible. I can't take my money out of the country that easily. Stock market is like a wild tiger. You don't know whether it's better to be on its back or off of it. And so diversifying a bit more into not only cash, but into gold. That seems to make sense. And so you buy gold. When the uh, Chinese family buys gold, is that good for gold miners? Maybe in some kind of long, protracted sense that the demand for gold, now they have to mine more gold. But I tend not to think of it through all those that lengthy chain of causality. I think that typically I think that I'd be watching gold and uh, thinking the gold miner that's so much separate from that. Makes sense. I think it's two different markets who buys gold and who buys the gold mining stocks. But what about the rest of the commodity sector? With their stronger dollar expectations, won't that continue to pressure things like the base metals, like oil? I don't know. I, I kind of think that uh, base metals and uh, energy are sort of separate and geopolitical. 
huge cartels, of course. But I, I generally think that when the, you know, if, if I'm right about the dollar, that the dollar not only is going to close this week on a bid tone, but will strengthen in the next couple of weeks. I think on the margins that exert some downward pressure on commodities. Uh, the key, I think, I'd, I'd break up the commodities a bit. I mean, some uh, great, uh, great harvests in uh, both Brazil and it looks like a good uh, season for the, for the U.S. Uh, and Argentina. That's all helps uh, depress the uh, the grains. I think that the the metals, the industrial metals. You know, we, I look at who's doing the, who does the manufacturing in the world. It tends not to be the U.S. It tends not to be Europe so much. It tends to be China. And so uh, I, I watch those Chinese numbers and their trade figures as the key sort of marginal demand for the industrial metals. Uh, and I don't think they're performing so good, partly because people are still unsure that the Chinese economy can grow at 5% without more stimulus. So, Mark, big picture then. Are we in this environment that is risk on, don't fight the Fed and other central bank environment where markets, the equities broadly could continue to perform strongly? Yeah, you know, as the stock market scares, especially the U.S. stock market scares me. I mean, it seems like even on days like where you have a, a pullback, uh, people are just like sort of like a horse at the at the gate. So can't wait to get out, can't wait to buy the dip. And so we don't get really strong pullbacks. But uh, it seems to me to be really stretched and not really prepared for this, uh, uh, for what could be the you know, turning point in the cycle later this year. You know, a lot of the growth that the Fed's forecasting seems to be, will be delivered in the first half of this year. So like last year, I think uh, mentally I'm preparing for a weaker second half of the year. And maybe that's when we get that pullback in stocks. All right, Mark, I guess we're all still kind of waiting for that pullback in stocks. We had a number of commentators saying that maybe this week would be the week where the market showed some weakness. And well, they're showing a little bit of weakness to end the week. But overall, we did just have the S&P go up well over 5,200. And quite frankly, look, these markets, investors seem to continue to put money into the markets and now even in a wider sense in terms of sectors. Mark, it's always great chatting with you. We'll post a link to your website, Mark2Market, where everyone can keep up to speed on what you're seeing in terms of economic data, as well as market moves. Great having you on the show, Mark. I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks. Good luck to everybody.